Penny Daniel, and this is the Museum of Interesting Things, which is a, a traveling museum, goes all over the country and shows people their iPods, it's not like that. <laughs> it shows people kind of the history of invention. Um, and of course, for the 100th anniversary, it's going to be the suffragette show. Um, I like to say I show all the missing links, the link factor, all the links in the chain, until you get to an invention. Uh, people think their iPhones popped out of thin air. They didn't pop out of thin air. And people think invention is some sort of mysteriousness. It's not mysteriousness of voodoo at all. What does an inventor really do? An inventor solves a problem. That's all really an inventor does. They've turned it into some sort of rocket science. But most of the things in our life are what I call common sense, uh, made complicated. And I, I actually. I did, a, I did a show at this computer geek place in, in Manhattan, and some guy in the very back row said, I have a question. I said, what's your question? He goes, well, if all an inventor does is solve a problem, then what constitutes an inventor? What does it mean to be an inventor? And I thought, uh-oh, I have to think of a good answer for all of you. Now, thank God our book become the answer. <laughs> so I walked up to that person, and I grabbed his book, and I said, did you tie this shoe? Did you tie this shoe? Ladies and gentlemen, this woke, woman woke up with a problem. Her shoe was untied, and I noticed that you double knotted your shoe. Are you a rocket scientist? Are you a NASA engineer? A Columbia University PhD? Wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my good lady, you've invented the double knot. Give her a hat. <laughs> and that's really all inventors do. They just solve a problem. Just like double knotting your shoe, or a shortcut to this place, or a quicker way to butter your toast. They've turned everything into some sort of mysteriousness, but nothing is mysterious. It's like I said, everything is common sense, made complicated. Every day you solve a problem, that makes you an inventor. But you know what? There was one problem that took a long time to solve, giving women the vote. <laughs> Why did that take 100 years? God only knows. <laughs> but we'll start going through some of that history. The first item I always like to show when I do my, my uh, shows, no matter what the theme is, is this one over here. Does anyone know what this is? Well, step right up. I have a volunteer. <laughs> and you want to try it? Grab that. Yep. Now, clearly, this woman here is a child because it has a child safety. You notice that you're doing that? Yeah. Uh, that's because Thomas Edison knew that ch children like her would walk up to this and overwind it. Because you're taking a piece of wet metal and overwinding it would make it break. break. So, he, you know those medicine bottles where you have to push them in and then it yeah. Yeah. I thought those were invented in the 80s. They were. The 1880s. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not. So with Edison, he realized that people would overwind it, so you have to push it in. And then wind it, and then you'll see it work. So go ahead. Mm -hmm. And now you can feel the tension, right? It's harder for you to do this. <laughs> and that should be good. And then are you guys ready? Yeah. yeah. You don't sound ready. Are you ready? We're yeah. ready. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've worked at Coney. I need a lot more. <laughs> were these cylinders, originally made out of wax, beeswax, and two other ingredients to make them a little more sturdy, and then the later ones were made out of celluloid, which is just a fancy word for plastic. Now the only thing is that I, we're, we're at the Maple Grove Cemetery, and I can see the staff is getting terribly angry. You, you, you guys want us to lower the volume, don't you? Because we'll obviously wake the dead. <laughs> so, so before they shut us down, can you find the volume on this thing? Look how angry they're getting. You know what, you know what? You, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to take off your shoe and give me your sock. Because there is no volume, it's a horn. I, I didn't want to torture her and take off her shoe. <laughs> but yep, you would have to take off your shoe and put a sock in it. You know that term, put a sock in it? We researched it, we had professional librarians verify. It comes from the Edison horn. Give her a hand. She's a Are you? Oh, that's perfect. Yep, we actually had the branch manager, and now she runs all of the Lexi. 
uh, what the librarian in Biloxi, Mississippi, who researched it. And it really does come from the Edison cylinders. So these are the first records. They were made out of originally wax, beeswax, and this one is made out of celluloid. And it's not voodoo getting sound on that at all. Basically, my, when I talk to you, my mouth, my voice, makes sound waves that hit your eardrum. So instead of hitting your eardrum, you could hit tin or Play-Doh, not Play-Toe, he's a big, big guy, or wax. So you, Ada Jones and her whole orchestra would have to be in this room. And they would sing into that horn. And you get a recording needle and a blank record, and she'd sing. By the light of the silvery moon. And then, like a sewing machine, it goes up and down. So just like when I talk to you, if I said, hello, and you play it back, hello, it's just moving air the same way my mouth, my tongue moves air. I make lots of noises with my mouth. Ask my mother, she'll tell you. In fact, she lives just a few blocks away that way. <laughs> so she will tell you. So these were the first records, as I mentioned. I'm going to let you guys actually touch that out. You can pass it down, and when it gets to the back, just bring it back up to me. And the person you were here. So these were invented in 1877. That's an 1800s machine, late 1800s. Uh, that was Ada Jones, A-D-A -A Jones. Uh, she was the first big female recording artist. This was the first of those big stars. And to have a woman star back then was a big deal. Uh, that was the first recording of Underneath the Silvery Moon from 1902. Uh, and she influenced people like Billie Holiday and Bessie Smith and all the artists that we know. This was the first female recordist. And she, she actually had many records. I ha I'm one of her biggest fans, in fact. I have over 30 of her records. Yeah, and every one of those records is, what do you think? Five songs, 10 songs, 20 songs? One song. One song. Yeah. yeah. And, and originally, they were only two minutes long. Yep. And then the later records, like that one, the, the, the uh, celluloid ones, were only four minutes long. So if, your, so if your song was Hey Jude, you were done at the chorus. Yeah. <laughs> and when you, when you think about it, today's music, radio play tends to be around four or five minutes. But think about what happened before that. It was Mozart, it was Beethoven, it was concertos, 15 minutes, a half an hour. All of a sudden now they think we can't handle more than four minutes, five minutes. But we handled 15 minutes to a half an hour but back before that. It conditioned us, these records conditioned us that a song should be around five minutes, four minutes long. And that's why now songs are in that realm. And it was only when the Beatles came out with things like, hey, dude, and things like that. And radio stations actually revolted against it. Imagine that. Um, but she was, yeah, one of the first big female uh, recording artists. And I'm, I'm, like I said, one of her biggest fans. I'm hoping that she tours one day. <laughs> yeah. Right, she's probably here somewhere. <laughs> she may be here somewhere. One of the one of the books that I like to show here, and people who came over the table were probably wondering why I have Frankenstein over here. Well, it all starts with Rousseau. Rousseau. Well, Rousseau, the philosopher, came out with a book called Emily. This book came out in the late like 1700s. And when he wrote this book, he made someone a little bit unhappy. Mary Wollstonecraft. And if you don't know Mary Wollstonecraft, she wrote a book in reaction to Emily and started the modern women's movement, the women's rights movement. Why? Because Mary didn't feel that his portrayal of Emily was very good. And she decided to write a response a vindication of the rights of women. That book changed everything. This book came out, I'd say, turn of the century, 17th into 1800s. Yeah, that's when this book, so imagine a woman writer coming out with a book that changes everything, the vindication of the rights of women. And that starts really the modern women's movement. There's been a women's movement for ages. I mean, if you go back to uh, the writings of the Greeks and all that, with, with some of their plays like Lysistrata, you know, these are, you know, there was always kind of a women's movement, but this started the modern women's movement. So why do I have Frankenstein right next to her? It was written by a woman, Mary Shelley, but that woman was her daughter. Yeah, <laughs> that's Mary Shelley's mom. 
<laughs> yeah, talk about good genes. So that's why I always keep Frankenstein right there, which also kind of, you know, a woman writing a novel like Frankenstein, it was a big thing. So that's why I always keep Frankenstein there, and it always shocks everyone. There's very few people that realize that that was actually mom. Mm. But then I keep a prohibition prescription for whiskey next to that. Now, why would I keep that? And often I'll have all the things that have to do with the civil rights movement. And why would I have those things also next to that? Because originally, those three movements were kind of one movement. And for a long time, they were one movement. The women getting the vote, the suffrage movement, and then the, uh, the temperance movement, the, uh, you know, the prohibition movement, and then the civil rights movement. And people started to realize that men are just not going to agree with all of these things at once. So everyone said, all right, well, let's make our bed in line. So the movements kind of separated in the mid-1800s when people said, all right, I'm going to be fighting for the prohibition movement because temperance is my issue. And then other people said, I'm going to fight for women getting the vote. That's my issue. And other people said, I'm going to fight for blacks getting freedom. And that's my issue. And it kind of separated in the mid-1800s. But up until then, it was kind of one big movement. You still see some cross-pollination. Between them, you'll find a lot of temperance people who are also the same people that were fighting for women's suffrage. But it tended to kind of split in that era. So you'll see kind of a, you know, a, a kind of a correlation between them. And I brought a whole bunch of items later on, but, you know, come on over. I'll try to end early enough before the concert so you can come over. And you are allowed to touch, lightly of course, but you are allowed to touch the items and look at them because how many times are you going to get a ta chance to touch some of these things? Um, and I've got some items that you're not going to believe when we get to them, like voting machines from back then. So it's very important to get a chance to actually touch them. Now this book here, because the, the suffragette movement, everyone always thinks, and now people call it suffrage, you know, you have all these different names, but I still call it the suffragette because they call themselves that. And I'm like, those people are dead and I can't really <laughs> change their mind now. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of, I have a joke that I have about this. There's, all, there's also this silly little band called Led Zeppelin, which should change their name. Because you know where they got their name from. The same thing. It was a newspaper on it. It was somebody that insulted them and said, oh, that band's terrible. They're going to They're gonna sink like a Led Zeppelin. Oh. Yeah. And I think it was one of the Beatles, actually, that was the one that insulted those stones. But it was, one of, it was someone very famous that insulted them and said, that band's terrible. They're going to sink like a Led Zeppelin. And they said, you know what? We're changing our name. <laughs> and they changed their name from some other name, which I can't even remember anymore, to Led Zeppelin because of that. And it's like some people, sometimes you empower yourself with a word that was originally derogatory. And a hundred years later, you know, you can't take that away from that movement because that's what they decided to do. I mean, it's okay to come up with more terms. That's great. And I'm always, as a historian, you're like, yes, everything is cool. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to demonize people that are passing on. <laughs> because they did even with all their books, The Suffragette, and it's Pankhurst. So I doubt she was insulting herself. <laughs> so that said, I think as historians, it's very important to preserve history. Uh, you never ever censor, you never ever throw things away. Especially these days, if you notice nowadays, everybody's kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And it's important as historians to keep everything so we don't repeat history. It's really important to remember history and keep it the way it was. So the suffragette movement wasn't just about women getting the vote. It was a movement about multiple things. It was about really a rights movement. So there was also a fashion movement. Because what was the fashion at the time? Here's a fantastic book. And thumb through it later, very carefully, with all these wonderful women's styles, which were these bustle dresses. Because part of the fight was to get rid of this whole business of women practically being in bondage over these bustle dresses. So I brought you one. This is an original 1880s bustle dress. Ladies, you clearly didn't come here dressed like that, did you? You must have changed from your bustle dresses in the restroom over here and then changed into your you know, comfortable clothes, but clearly no man would let you walk out like that. You go, you don't go to jail. <laughs> clearly, you walked in with a bustle dress like that. <laughs> right, all of you were, couldn't even sit on a subway. <laughs> you could not ride a bicycle. 
she could hardly walk. The walls, with the walk, the walls, most of the steps were forward for the lady. Why? Because if a lady walked backwards at all, you'd probably kill yourself. <laughs> so most of the steps were always forwards for the lady, because there was no way you could do such a thing. So these were the dress, and this is, you notice, it's probably a size negative one. <laughs> yeah, it was part. Yeah, pretty much you fainted. And you'll notice over here, it's possibly hard to see, but there it is. That's one of the, this is called a lobster bustle. Right. So these, this is an original Civil War era bustle. Yeah, and we don't have just one of them, we've got a few. Because these are like the Holy Grail. They're almost impossible to find. So this is what you ladies came here with, right? Yeah. So one of you stand up, come on. <laughs> so obviously you would have had to fit inside this and turn around, because this would be coming out your back like that. Oh, behind? You have to go in? Yeah, you're going to go in it, but we're not going to put you in it, because okay, yeah, this you. is fragile. But she would have had this, and she would have had this long, beautiful dress. And it did, you know, these things look beautiful, but they were impossible to walk around. How would you sit in that chair with this? I mean, there's no way. It's kind of like an iron man. So they were fighting against this. And this was hard to fight because men did not agree. Um, and then there was a woman called um, Amelia Fleur. <laughs> right there. And in fact, I noticed that the uh, Maple Grove has a nice sign over here. And funny enough, I have the exact same picture in the original wire photo. So. Amelia Bloomer, she went to Turkey and she saw that women in Turkey were wearing these harem hats. And she said, women in Turkey have more freedom than the land of the free. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> they said, women, you need to change, you need to revolt. You need and she started in this paper, I think her husband was also a publisher, so she published her own paper, I think it was called The Lily. And, and she ended up publishing this paper and totally promoting the, this is what women should wear in America. You should wear these bloomers. And bloomers were considered outside clothing, not inside. Now everything, it's kind of like almost underwear is what people think of bloomers. But the truth is it wasn't considered underwear, certainly not for the Turkish. That's what people wore. And I hear it, in fact, pass that around. And this one is, it's called After the Battle. And basically what she's doing, uh, Oh, they're always joking about women being scared of mice. <laughs> so this is her beating the mouse. <laughs> so it wasn't just a fight for the vote, it was a fight for mice. <laughs> and there are other ones where the woman's doing a lecture, her suffragette lecture to her husband. And there are even uh, these ones called diableries, the devil slides. Which were, the, which were the stereoscope slides of the devil in hell, but they actually had, in the 1860s, which is really cutting edge, in France, which didn't give women the vote until 1946, hello. Uh, yeah, viva la France and viva la Yeah, not so much when it came to women. It took them till 46. But yet, in the 1860s and 70s, they came out with spoofs on the devil in hell but they actually had one that was a suffragette one where the devil's daughter is wearing harem pants. And, she, and on top of her it says emancipation and liberté. And she's lecturing the inhabitants of hell that women should have rights in hell. How amazing is that? So the women's movement made it all the way down there as well. <laughs> so it kind of went everywhere. Very powerful movement. And then I have, for some reason, Catherine Hepburn here. Anyone know why? She was a dance player. And she, her, her mom was part of the suffragette movement. Yeah, her family were suffragettes. And they had the, the every, all the gear and everything. So I was like, that is, as it is, I had so much respect for Catherine Hepburn and Audrey Hepburn from the too, even though the names, they're not related. But both of them were amazing women. And I thought it was really cool that that she actually uh, was also part of that heritage and is very proud of it. She's kept her mom's stiff. I think some of it is she donated to places, but she really kept
kept that heritage alive. And people also don't realize with, um, with um, uh, Mary Poppins, there's also a suffragette theme in that, which I thought was really wonderful that they kind of snuck it into Hollywood uh, in, in wonderful, wonderful ways. Hmm, interesting. You always see the suffragettes wearing these cute, these beautiful big hats. You know, these beautiful hats. But why do I have these hat pins? Hmm, interesting. Well, at one point, men thought that the women were going to stab them with hat pins. And they got afraid of these hat pins. So, I brought to you a regulation hat pin. Hat pins were no longer, they made long ones. No, no, that's crazy. You could kill someone with that. So they decided nine inches was as far as we can go with the hat pins. It was like seven or nine inches, something like that. So can I have a male volunteer, please? Step right up. So ladies, this is a safe hat pin. Can you stand right over here and give them your, your wonderful profile? Excellent. And here is a completely legal hat pin that's completely safe. Goes right through him, through his neck to the other side, doesn't it? Do you feel safe? I feel very unsafe. Yeah, you think? I mean, no matter what part of his body we put this through, this goes clear to the other side and sticks out the other side more than an inch, right? Pretty much, whether this is 11 inches or 7 inches, you're doomed, right? You're not happy. Yeah, yeah. Give him a hand. He did a great job. You survived. With all these rooms. Yeah, they outlawed the ones that were longer than this. God only knows why, because either way it would kill you. But men were afraid, and, men, and it was all this crazy fear mongering. Boy, those of us in this generation don't know fear mongering. Yeah, we finally cured ourselves of that. Mm, yeah, we need to learn from this. Now, look at our audience over here. Some interesting. Some interesting people we've got here today. But I notice we might have a couple of spies in the audience. Yeah, I definitely see a couple of spies here. Hmm. Sorry to have to out you today. But yes, it, stand right up. Yes, we have, a, we have a suffragette spy here, clearly. Because she's wearing the secret code. Is it okay if I tell them the secret code that you're wearing? No. No. Some of the men should close your ears. The men should not hear this. Because she is wearing the secret code. Back then, you notice they're, they're often wearing the white and all these things. So, so, so there's some women we have over here in the white. Yeah, so, so she's got the white over here. But she's got a little bit of cheese. Okay. Put some white there. And then, you know, passing for your violet over there. Uh, you know, kind of sort of violet. And uh, there should be some green somewhere. Maybe she has green socks or something. No. But if you have one or all three of those colors, one, two, or all three of those colors, red, white, and green, that was kind of a secret code for the suffragettes. Yeah, that was the secret code. I see. I think you have almost all the colors, don't you? Yeah, yeah, step right up. <laughs> yes, I think you have almost all of the colors. There's a... Our beautiful suffragette spy here. Yep, she's got the white. And you, there's the violet. Excellent. She's got the violet. I didn't even see that right away. And there's the green right up over there. So so can I tell them the secret code? Okay, so and, and here's my favorite of the suffragette postcards. Where did I put my cat? Excellent. The suffragette cat, which everybody loves. I actually use this as my flyer. Time Out Magazine prints it almost every time. Yeah, this is my suffragette cat, also wearing, you know, given I, uh, I demand the, we demand the vote, and the cat's wearing the green, white, and violet. And the green, white, and violet stood for give women a vote. Green, white, and violet. So, good job. So that's why you often see those colors in a lot of the suffragette outfits and a lot of the brooches. <laughs> so they would often, so when you find jewelry from that era and it has those three colors, you're, you actually are holding suffragette. Their movement was much more, the only way to affect change is to shake things up a little bit. It's just a different way of skinning a cat. 
Sorry, Kat. <laughs> the Americans felt it needed to be more girly, and they felt it needed to be a little bit more militant. And they had stores there, which I'm going to leave you one of the department stores, kind of like their version of Macy's, that would basically have the uniform that the suffragette would wear, the more militant version. And these were, you know, big department stores, kind of like Macy's all of a sudden deciding we're, we're getting on the bandwagon for this. So it wasn't like this weird offshoot, you know, place. It was really big department stores were part of this. So, so you want the way, uh, the way uh, uh, dressmaker dresses you. So you want to go like that, and uh, turn around, go like that, and then you have your arms like that, and you're going to actually try this on. Take a turn. Nice. <laughs> I'm pretty good at guessing who would fit it pretty well. And give her a hand. <laughs> Not bad. This is your fashion show. How often do you get to wear a suffragette dress? Yeah. <laughs> It really brings it home, you know, with these things. And this dress, the way I got this was, it was an educator in the Carolinas, and she would take this to schools all over and show kids where the movement comes from and actually have the kids, you know, see it and try it. I'm not sure if she had people try it on. But then she retired and found out that I'm doing this in New York with the museum, and I was doing a show in New Jersey for a school. It's my first suffragette show. And she said, I, I, I want you to have this so that it continues teaching for generations to come. So, uh, so now it's getting even more play. And so, you know, she's probably down there smiling. That was over, uh, probably around 10 years ago. And I brought one of the hats that they would have had the hat pinned to. <laughs> And this beautiful piece. I love their slogans. Women bring all voters into the world. Let women vote. Isn't that beautiful? You know this guy. This is a guy who, did, who thought of this. And I, he may not have thought of the slogan, but he made this, he was commissioned by the suffragette movement. And you know this guy. It was very important that he did this. Because he's the same guy who did Uncle Sam. Oh. Yep. So they were they were very strategic on who they picked. His name, ironically, is Flag. <laughs> James Montgomery Flag. So this is a piece by James Montgomery Flag. He also agreed with the movement and decided to do this and use his name uh, as part of this movement. And by the way, Uncle Sam goes back to the Civil War era, having to do with some letters that people sent. But then he was commissioned by Leslie Magazine uh, to come up with a face from Uncle Sam, and he picked an army soldier he saw on a train uh, on the way home from, the, from having been deployed. And he picked that army soldier, and that was the face of Uncle Sam for many, many years until it started to morph into actually his face. And you'll notice the resemblance between F Mr. Flag and Uncle Sam. Eventually, it became, he became the face of Uncle Sam. Uh, but he did this piece, and I was always very, very uh, proud of having that one. Women get the vote, but the next major election is 1920. So I got the Holy Grail. That is a voting machine wow. from 1920. Yep. Now this is a voting machine as a tester, as a teaching machine. So this is the machine people would use to learn how to vote, and then they'd go into the voting booth and vote. But who's learning to vote in 1920? Women. Men know how to vote. They've been voting. So this machine was probably used entirely by women at that time. And what I love about it is, if you walk over to this machine later and look closely, it still says President Carter on the machine. No one changed it. So it still has the original suffragette election. So you can vote for the suffragette election right now, right here, on this machine. And it's probably better choices dead, <laughs> these people, than the people we have living. That's the irony. <laughs> And what's another little interesting anecdote is if you look at the competing ballot, you'll notice a, a guy who, you know, you might remember. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah, he ran against them. 
<laughs> and as vice president on the other ticket. Yeah, and he lost that race and then came back as president. But this is the first race he was in in 1920. So you definitely afterwards want to walk over to this and take a look at that item. And I have, believe it or not, um, the original poll books from back then as well. So, and I've got it bookmarked over here with that post-it. So when you open up to where the post-it is, you'll see, and go ahead and read that out loud for everyone. Warren G. Harding, It still has Harding, Harding and Coolidge right on it. How cool is that? And of course, James Cox was going for president, who was going for vice president. Franklin D. Roosevelt. So this, when you went to your voting station, is the original. How cool is that? <laughs> and you can see handwritten names, you know, handwritten stuff right inside here. Of the people who voted. And even, I don't even know which one's for. It's hard to decide. I don't know how, I, I got very lucky. It was years ago, and everyone asked me, how do I get all these pieces? Years ago, I got a phone call in December from a school in New Jersey that said, can you do a suffragette show? And I always wanted a suffragette item, and in all the years I was doing this, never found one item. And you know, she goes, can you do a show for Women's Month in March on the suffragettes? And I'm a born and raised New Yorker, right here in Forest Hills, and you know, mom still lives in Jamaica Estates. I slept there last night, came here from there, and literally blocks away from call. <laughs> and uh, you know, I was like, yeah, I totally can do this. You know, being a born and raised New Yorker, he's sure I could do a suffragette show. I had nothing, nothing. <laughs> and I thought I got three months <laughs> to make this happen, but there's no way I'm not letting. You know, the Museum of Interesting Things should have a suffragette show. Clearly, that's an interesting thing. And I said, it's such an important part of history. So I literally hung up the phone and said, oh my god, i got to do something. And it's weird. That first hour to two hours, all of a sudden, th things fell in my lap that I never thought I'd ever seen, that I'd never seen before that. And it was literally the first hour. And it was as if nature looked at me and said, it didn't want me to have a chance to make a decision. I didn't get a chance to research yet. I didn't get a chance to check, is this real? Is it fake? Is it important? Is it not? I was getting voting machines and suffragette dresses and poll books and all these things were showing up all of a sudden and, and I didn't have time to check. And I just, I spent about twenty to thirty thousand dollars in like a month or two. I was like, but I said, you know what? It's worth it because for decades to come, this museum, we plan on getting a building, hopefully in Queens, because we think we belong in Queens. And that way will outlive us and all these pieces will be somewhere and teach for years to come. No one's going to remember what, how I did it, what I spent, all that. What's going to remember is all the kids and all the adults that we inspire. And that's what's important. And I said I did it, and it ended up taking care of it. I, I don't, the bill's gone. I never paid a dollar in interest. I was an economics major at NYU. I managed to do all of it on my own, bootstrapping it, no one else helping. And all those, in, Three months later, I did that show in the school, and it had, like I'd say, 80% of the items you're looking at to 90% were purchased in that first three months. And I had the, almost the entire show, and now I just add little bits here and there, uh, because um, places like Lincoln Center and the Philharmonic came by the apartment to see some of the items, and I said, well, they're really cool, and I got these in the past month. Back then, for that show, and I couldn't believe I owned this, and what's amazing about this is this actually says all the people that voted in the 1920 election. And we started tallying up men to women, and more women voted in these, re in these spots than men because they were so energized that they were, there were more women voters most of the time in, the, in these books, which I found really interesting. But if you thumb through it, you actually, this one you do see the names of voters and who they voted for. And it, what's interesting is the parties back then you had some parties that you may not have heard of. So there was Democrat, Republican, Progressive. There was a Prohibition poly, poly, uh, Party, a Socialist, Labor, Independent. I love this one. Doubtful. <laughs> First voter, 
colored and absent gold. So it's a very cool piece of history in multiple ways. So I'll leave that one over there for you guys. Does that mean that voting was not anonymous? Um, it's weird. It was, it was still anonymous, but I mean, people literally, I have some ballots from Abraham Lincoln's election, and it was literally on the back of the ballot you'd see two votes. You know, and it was, it was almost like the honor system. I mean, I don't know, they must have had wild fraud uh, back then, because the voting system was very interesting. It was very, very scary. Like, you think today, you know, but yeah, it was very interesting, the voting system back then. Uh, it was literally almost like the honor system, especially the Abraham Lincoln ballot. I was shocked when I saw it just said two votes on the back. I was like, really? That's it? <laughs> two votes? We're good? <laughs> I was like, that's a frightening thought. And actually, that one I keep in my bag, in my personal bag at all times. Because I still can't believe I own a ballot to vote for Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Which means, technically, you guys can vote for Abraham Lincoln today on my ballot. <laughs> and he's still probably a better choice, like I said, than everyone <laughs> I run, No matter what side of the fence you're on, he's still a pretty good choice. I'd vote for him today, dead. <laughs> Ironically. So we're getting towards the end. Uh, so now women have the vote on that one, but I'm going to show you some of the interesting uh, postcards, go a little bit further back in time. So we saw some of the other ones, the cat and the bloomers, but, and I did this straight from the first show. And this was one of my most fun moments in the show with the kids. There's about 300 kids. And I walked up to them and I said to them, this is what happens if you give women the vote. <laughs> and it's true. Think about it. Women. Especially, I know today, but think about it back then, in the 1800s. Are not women the head of the household? I mean, we must admit, women were back then, even more than today, the head of the household. So clearly, we must agree, if women are the head of the household, then clearly, who will do the laundry? I mean, look at this man. I mean, look at this crying baby. Who will feed the children? I mean, clearly, if you give women the vote, and women are head of the household, then we must unanimously, unanimously, men and women agree that who will feed the child? And look, even the cat is hungry. I mean, who will feed the, the kitty? I mean, come on. You know, Trixie the cat. You know, who will feed the poor cat? I mean, clearly, we must agree to this. And I tell the kids, we must. if women are head of the household, it is true. But you know what I never understood? By this logic, and it took me about five seconds to realize this, and I don't know why I've looked for 12 years, I have not found one spoof on what I realized in the first three seconds of realizing this logic. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's agree, women should not have the vote. Because clearly, the dishes and the kitchen. Because women are head of the household. But then again, aren't men head of the corporations and the government and everything else. So if women shouldn't vote because they're head of the household, then if men are head of the companies and the government, men shouldn't vote either, should they? Because if the house is going to fall apart, we have evidence. Here's the evidence. Ladies, do you not see that man doing the laundry? I mean, ladies, are you not seeing the man do a terrible job of the laundry? And look at the crying baby. Do you not see the crying baby? I mean, are you not a man? If you're in charge of the government, men, then if this happens to the house, shouldn't this happen to the United States of America? Clearly, if men vote, then the whole country should fall apart, and all the companies should fall apart as well. For that five minutes it takes for you to go click and vote, Clearly, the whole country should fall apart. Men and women, I give you, should not vote. Who should vote? My cat. The cats and the dogs have nothing to do. Clearly, look at this cat. He's demanding the vote, and he has nothing to do. He's not feeding the baby. He's not doing the laundry. He's not president. He should be, but he's not president. <laughs> My cat would make a great, Tristan would make a fantastic president, but he's not. So clearly, and I think my cat would do a better job anyway, and I think anyone who has a pet realizes they'd probably do a better job, they should vote. We'd probably get a better system. So I, I present to you today that only cats and dogs should be voting. And nowadays, everyone has lizards and crazy things. <laughs> so maybe lizards should vote as well. Who knows? So now they had all these things on women careers. So this is 1917. 
which one of these jobs, ladies, can you fill? Look at how progressive already they were getting. And so you have World War II when women ended up entering the workforce and things really changed. There was no choice. And all of a sudden women entered the workforce, men went to war, and you have all these careers happening. This is a, a little bit later, but it just gives you an idea. Like the Riveter. <laughs> you know. I love this one, a jail guard with her rifle. <laughs> This is probably 70s. And I've got all the various careers here, dental and everything. So after the army, of course, men tried to put them back into the kitchen, and that didn't work out so well. And you have a second kind of incarnation of the women's movement because women already got the vote. So now it's not about the vote. You end up having all these new books come out, The Second Self and all these other books come out of the second you know, the next generation of the movement where it's like, well, now we've had jobs, now we've had careers, we want to keep this up. And there became this weird dichotomy between people, where, how to raise a family and how to actually make a living and have an, some sort of independence. And that became a big fight then. Then you have the whole era of the 60s. And you have books on the new feminism and what's going on. And what sparks this? Birth control. All of a sudden you have birth control and that changes everything. And all of a sudden you have this whole, another dichotomy on a, on, a, on a women's movement. And they have books like, some of you might remember, The Feminine Mystique. And that changed everything and changed the game. And that brings us up to date, and I brought some of the books from that era over here, because, like I said, the whole movement isn't just the vote. And now you've realized it's even the whole uh, segregation and slavery movement, and now you realize it's also part of the temperance movement, a fashion movement, it becomes workplace movement, even riding bicycles. There's so many other facets to this that people don't realize that it's not just one thing and it does it and it lasted quite a long time and there were a lot of ladies involved in it so I have of course Susan B. Anthony and Victoria Woodhill. People think that nobody ran for president until, the, until recently. People don't realize that a lot of things happened at a time that was much more dangerous and much more cutting edge and much more interesting. Uh, one of my favorite of the women is one that nobody knows. Um, she, do you know the Little Red Schoolhouse? Do you know who started that? She's one of the most amazing people ever. Uh, Elizabeth, I forget her last name now, it's now like Irving or something. But the woman who started that was a PhD at Columbia University in the 1800s. That's hard to do today. <laughs> you know, did everyone here go to Columbia University PhD? My sister did, ironically. <laughs> Most people didn't. Yeah, funny enough, she is. And worked for NASA, so when I say about the government. Yeah, <laughs> ironically. Um, but not everybody does that, certainly not in the 1800s. So if that isn't hard enough, a woman in the 1800s becoming a Columbia Univers University PhD, she starts her own school. That's already pretty cutting edge too, right? But she didn't just start a school, she started a school and made it part of the New York City public school system. And not only was it part of the public school system, she started a progressive school. She didn't fit the mold. She said, I'm gonna do something progressive and do some alternative learning. In the 1800s, she's doing this. So if, if all these aren't grounds for being like dragged out in the street and getting lynched, I mean, getting killed, getting, I mean, all these things are things that would banish this woman. Not only did she do, go that far, she was a lesbian and lived with her lover. A man. Every one of these aspects of her life are amazing that she managed to do this. And she managed to have the little red schoolhouse all the way up until the 1900s, the, the early 1900s. So she did this for decades, for over a decade, and managed to continue this until one of the mayors in New York finally a guy finally got jealous of all of this and annoyed and said, all right, enough of this woman. And what does she do? 
she turns it into a private school. She goes, fine. Turns it into an expensive elite private school, and now it's a private school on, uh, what is it, Bleecker Street or Third Street or something? And I actually did a gig there with the museum, researched her history, and said, this woman should be famous. She's unknown. And that's a tragedy. Even the school hardly knows her story. And this is a person that now I try to kind of, when I bring everything up to the modern era, I try to bring one person nobody knows about, and that's one of them. The, girl, the woman who started the Little Red Schoolhouse. And I really, eventually, when the museum has a home, uh, I plan on actually trying to find items from her. I've, I've been searching for literally almost a decade. And she wrote books. Where are these books? It's like, I have not been able to find it. Librarian, save us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, it's probably sitting there, and then that's it. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's where these books probably are sitting somewhere. Uh, but she's, like I said, an unknown. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you with that because there's a lot of unknowns like the people that came out with that movie, uh, hidden figures. You know, there's a lot of unknowns that are out there, not just the you know the knowns that deserve a great deal of credit. Like Susan B. Anthony should be on a bill. Um, you know, it's also these amazing unknowns that went unsung uh, that I'm hoping people find. And like I said, that's one of them, and that is my show. Thank you. Thank you.